Ah, sneaking in the back. Switch programs. mother, Carolyn Parsons, to Erica Lynn Parsons of Rowan County. She was reported missing July the 30th of 2013 by her adopted brother. She was born February 24th, 1998 in Cabarrus County. I gave Erica up for adoption to my brother-in-law and my sister-in-law because at the time, I was not able to provide a steady home. I was not able to have a steady job and the family and support that I needed to raise a fourth child. Casey and Sandy Parsons have always been a part of my life. Sandy was in my wedding when I married his brother. I had no reason at all to ever doubt that Erica would be loved and Erica would, would be cared for and taken care of. I got to call that no parent, especially a mother, wants to receive July 30th of 2013, which was asking me, did I have a child by the name of Erica Lynn Parsons? I continued to ask why. I was told that until I answered that question, they could not tell me. So I answered the question, yes. They told me that her adopted brother had walked in at eight o'clock that morning and reported that Erica had not been seen nor heard from since December of 2011. I was living in Louisiana at the time. About two weeks later, I took a leave of my job I came back to North Carolina. I met with the FBI, the SBI, lead investigators, um, numerous of other people in complete shock, very angry, very bitter because the people I trusted, the people who had been a part of my oldest three children's lives and done very well with them now have a child that belongs but they're not answering questions they lawyered up so that they wouldn't have to i was told at one point to not do interviews when i decided that nobody else was speaking up for erica that it was time for me to step up and be the mother and do so i was told to quit doing interviews or go home I went back to Louisiana. A year later, they still knew no more then than they did when it started. I came back, but I came back with determination that somebody was gonna do something and that meant get out from behind your desk and do your job. I pushed and I pushed and I pushed. Years later, 
Erica's remains were found September 27th. of 2016. It was made public September 29th of 2016. Through the investigation, I learned of her abuse. I learned that her abuse was mine times 10. I also learned she did not have a bedroom. She did not have a bed. She lived in a closet and slept on a piece of carpet. No pillows, no blankets, no anything. She was not allowed to celebrate holidays. She was not allowed to have birthdays. She was kept at home by herself. Family that knew made one phone call, maybe two if you were lucky. My reason for being here today, I want to do something helping children. I still have so much anger, so many mixed emotions. I don't know which direction I need to go. I don't know where I need to go. My therapy for this is I talk about Erica's story. I talk about Erica's life. I talk about my abuse. I talk about the similarities. I also try to hold on to the good memories which was, I got to see Erica January the 5th of 2011. As the visit was over, I asked Erica if she'd come here and give me a hug. I rubbed her on the top of her head and gave her a kiss, told her that I loved her. I said, I'll see you in February, whether it be before your birthday or after. Needless to say, that visit didn't happen. 10 months and 15 days after that date is when they killed Erica. Um, I remember bringing Erica home from the hospital. She was so tiny, even preemie clothes, baby doll clothes were too big for her. She had a baby doll cradle. And as long as I wasn't in the room, I could snuggle her up with pillows and blankets and she would sleep just fine. I would go in that room to lay down to go to bed and she would cry and scream and holler. I'd pick her up, snuggle her, put her in the bed with me a few minutes. She'd go right back to sleep. If I would get up and put her in the cradle, I was back up to do it all over again. I do have good memories. But I also know that in order to keep abuse to children, adults, elderly, I can't let Erica's name, I can't let Erica's life, and I can't let Erica's story go untold. My hopes are, as long as I continue to do that, if Erica saves one life. If Eric can call somebody to make one phone call. And if that one phone call doesn't work, you call until you get the results that you want. And you don't stop with a phone call. You don't stop with walking in DSS one time. Because as we all know, DSS is a failed system and it continues to fail daily. As long as Erica's case can save one person, one child, 
make a difference in somebody else's life, maybe not maybe 10 years from now. To me, Erica did not go in vain. Erica was a very loved child. I did what I felt was best for her at that time because I was bound. <coughs> I was moved around from home to home, from place to place. When I was in DSS custody, if I was in a home for two weeks, I was considered fortunate. And I had two brothers growing up behind me that I was raising. I didn't want Erica moved around and bounced around from one place to the next, from one family to the next. I wanted her to have a steady home, a steady life, and the love that I wasn't going to be able to give her, the, the lifestyle I wasn't going to be able to give her. And I thought by trusting Casey and Sandy, hindsight's 50-50, would I do it again? Absolutely not. I would risk bouncing every day and every night because I would know she was with me. I have had a lot of negativity. I have had people telling me that I didn't raise Erica. I had no rights to be her voice. But you know what? When her adopted family doesn't step up, when nobody else does, reality is, I'm the birth mother. I did what was best for her. Maybe not for me, but for her. So yeah, I earned that right. Am I glad that I stepped up and decided to do what I had to do to make people mad and get the results that I got? Yes, I am. My remains were found when she was being searched for and I was posting on Facebook begging for help. Someone got in touch with me and recommended Q gave me the resources to reach out to Monica and her crew and her staff. And I am very grateful for everything that Monica has done, that Monica's staff has done, for the invitation to be here. Because being here and hearing other stories, <coughs> I'm hoping gives me the direction that I need to go. Because no matter how many times I tell it, that's my therapy, is to tell Erica's story and to keep her name and her face as out in the open <coughs> as possible. I think that everybody needs to know and everybody needs to be aware if you see something somewhere, if you're in a restaurant, if you're in a store, and it doesn't look normal, you don't have to be rude. Offer a suggestion. Hey, instead of screaming, take them outside. There's always another way. With my children, when I was mad, when I knew they were in trouble, because I was abused as a child, I would send my kids to go, go up the street and go play, go outside. I'm angry right now, and I don't want to see you. I don't want to deal with you. Because I know what abuse is. I know how it feels, and I know how it leaves you as a human being. And it's not normal. I grew up thinking that it was normal. Will I ever be the same person? Probably not. I will never love. I will never have the compassion that I had. I definitely will never feel the same way I do about family. And that is not my choice. That was a gift given to me. 
by two horrible, horrible people. It changes you as a person. It changes how you look at life. It changes how you feel about yourself. And it changes how you look at and see other people, which is not fair. It's not fair to me. It's not fair to Erica. But I do do what Erica would love for me to do. And that is to keep going. My terminology is I function. I can tell you everything I just told you. But have I taken the time to sit down and read the articles and actually think about what happened? Absolutely not. Because that's a person I don't want to become. The medical examiner, after they showed her medical reports, the medical examiner labeled Erica's death as modern day child torture. That's the one phrase I don't know how to get out of my head. had people tell me I'm wrong for how I feel, that I should forgive Casey and Sandy. Well, okay, maybe so. But if you had that terminology in your head, could you forgive them? Could you tell them you love them? And could you tell them that you could pray for them? Because I can't do any of it, and I don't want to. I do want to say I am grateful for everyone that is here. I am very grateful and honored that I was asked by Monica to be a guest speaker in hopes that I can find the direction that I need to go. And I will. I might have to go home and review things, but I will find what I need to do, and I will be successful at it. Mm, Erica, similarities to me, she was fed dog food. She was locked in a closet or a room. Most of the time at family dinners, she was allowed to stand by the table, but was not allowed to partake. If I would have known in 2011, Would I be in prison and jail right now? Yeah, probably. Because I would have left the visitation with her in arms. I have no clue as to why any of this happened. Speculations were that because that February, Erica was going to be 13 that maybe Erica had asked to see me after the first visit. Maybe Erica had said that she wanted to come back to me and Casey and Sandy didn't like it. I was told by Chad that this was years in the making and they allowed me to see Erica because they knew I would never forget that visit. I can tell you her home. I can tell you what her hair looked like. I can tell you what color her eyes were. Um, 
the day giveaway that I did not have her because that was the statement that they made that I had Erica. Erica had a cast on her arm. And they asked me, did I have proof? And I said, yes, I have it on my phone. You can see all that Facebook and you can have anything you want out of that phone. I gave them my Facebook password. They were able to pull up that picture because that's what I saved. I wanted that memory. I'm grateful I had that picture, but I also wonder as abused, as an abused child, what did I miss? What didn't I see? How do you walk away as an abused child yourself and not see the I was also told there were no signs. I saw her in February, January where she had on long sleeves and pants. Any bruises were covered. Her arm was in a cast. They told me she was chasing her two brothers and fell out of the tree. 12 years old, you're a girl with two brothers. That's absolutely believable because I would have done it. I'm not gonna be outdone by bro my brothers, absolutely not. I'm gonna climb up in the tree and jump off too. I believed it. I am that had a part in this case. Unlike so many people, and my heart goes out to you, I have a hard time reading these stories. I, I cannot, I cannot. I know how your heart feels to not know. The not knowing is the ultimate. Because you go to sleep and you wake up and that's all you want is answers. That's all you want is to know. And there are people day in and day out that don't get answers. I was blessed in that, that way. Rowan County stepped up to the bat when her remains were found. The cemetery dedicated her plot. Somebody donated a remainder of amount of money to have an angel bench done in her honor. The lead investigator at the very end of this closed the entire town for her funeral procession. This is an honor to me. This is a huge honor. And I'm very grateful for everyone here. If anyone has questions or comments, I will do my very best to answer what I know and what I don't know. I will do even work even harder to try to find you the answers. Some of these stories are going to be a little tough to listen to, but it's reality. Next is the family of Shanice Harris.
I really didn't <coughs> write much because um, I kind of jotted things down. And I'm, I'm, I apologize if I'm all over the place because I knew I was supposed to speak back in 2020, but then, of course, COVID hit. Uh, so I kind of knew for months, but yet actually almost years, that um, I was going to do this but yet still never really took the time to sit down and write it because it's like facing a reality that I don't want to face. Um, but like I said, please forgive me if I'm a little all over the place. I'm going to try to do my best here. Um, my name is Elvia Crump, and I'm the mother of Shanice Harris. And I also have three other daughters. Um, uh, I'll start off by telling you a little bit about Shanice. Um, Shanice had a very tough exterior, but yet on the inside was warm, loving, caring, compassionate. Um, she loved her family. She loved, uh, she was her, her sisters used to call her their keeper because she <laughs> wouldn't leave them alone if they were dating somebody and they didn't, she didn't feel like they were up to par. You know, she would have an issue with them. Um, she would nag them, always wanting to know where they were, what they were up to, if they were okay. Um, the same with myself. Uh, her and I both suffered of motion sickness. So if I ever came to Florida, because I have a daughter that lives in Florida, uh, if I ever went to Florida, she would always text me or <coughs> call me right immediately when the plane landed to make sure I was okay. Um, and when she went missing, that's where we were. We were in Florida. Uh, the last time I saw Shanice was May 21st. It was the day that I was on my way to Florida. Um, we had a very early morning flight, so she told me to wake her up before I left. And she was sleeping, so I figured I'll, I'll talk to her. I'll give her a hug and kiss, you know, when I get back. That was the worst mistake I ever made. Because when I got back, she wasn't there. Um, while I was on my trip, we spoke several times because she lived with me at the time. She had a girlfriend that lived with her as well. That was her relationship, her partner. Um, it helped me out. I'm frozen. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, Shanice, um, in, I'll, I'll go back a little bit, in, in 1995, um, it, Zelvia and I met, um, Kay at a, uh, a house, Kay, um, his warm New Year's Eve party. Um, it was an un for me. Um, she, she has, uh, it is four daughters, Kay, and Kay and I have his one daughter and two boys. Um, Nobody thought that, that that size of a family coming together would okay is ever okay is ever last. 25 years later, we are still here. Um, our family is very tight. Um, we we um, argue, we fight, we love each other, um, but, we, but, we, but we back each other no matter what. You might be, be mad at your sister or your brother, and that's fine that that's case normal, but if somebody comes to in case to harm them, everybody's coming. Mm -hmm. And Shanice was leading that charge. <laughs> okay. Um, we ha had gone to Florida um, and on the on the, the way there, my wife looks at me and she says, Babe, I, I, I have a bad feeling. I don't understand why, but I, I, I think something's going to happen <coughs> to Nisi. Now of course me is I'm like they just relax. It, it, it's probably just a feeling. Nisi Kate, Nisi's good. Um, is my daughter is about my height, a little bit shorter, about two about two about two hundred sixty pounds. Um, she, she is a, 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 a law enforcement. Uh, is I'm in, um, a sheriff for Orange County. Is New York um, Corrections, the division. Um, she loves sports. She she loved to, she she loved music, um, but she was a bouncer. So of course, as her father, I taught her how to is protect herself at at all at all times. 
Um, so we went to a Florida, and her is my wife talked every single day, two and three times a day, because that was just the relationship that that that, that they had. So we're in Florida. Um, is there talking? But on the uh, night of May twenty uh, ninth, um, she went to be one of her friends that she met at a new job that she, that, that, she, that okay, she had. And she was loving and caring. She loved old people. She, she loved to take and help them. She gave from the, 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 the heart. And I can tell you that my mother said to us that she had never seen a pure caring heart than what Shanice has. And she does because she would take and meet you, and you were you were automatically family. And she would take and give you the okay clothes off of her back, no matter what. I can tell you, she was a better friend to all of her friends than they were to her. And that's sad because in her time of of need, they are not around. Um, a little history on Shanice, uh, as far as her mental health, she did suffer from depression. She was diagnosed with uh, being bipolar at a very young age, around 13, 14 years old. Um, so with that struggle, she didn't, like we've tried medications with her, she, if they would either affect her liver or just have really bad side effects. So Shanice learned to cope through marijuana. Um, Unfortunately, that's where the relationship with this guy that she learned that she had it as a, a co-worker started. And because marijuana, you know, cost money, so she would sell a little bit to pay for her habit. Um, with that being said, I never knew that she would even, even think about selling weed. Uh, while I was in Florida, that's what she went to try to do. This is what all. Spe this is what I've been told. Like I, I obviously I can't confirm it. It's what I've been told. Um, so that night, she went to sell approximately a pound of marijuana. Was set up and got robbed. Went back to the dealer's house to inform him that she didn't have his money. And. Uh, her girlfriend at the time FaceTimed her and they had a FaceTime call and that was the last time Shanice was seen or heard from. The girlfriend re reported to us that she looked not like herself, um, slightly inebriated, like if she was under the influence of something, so I'm not quite sure what that was about. Uh, one of the issues that came up is I was in Florida of course, my children were, they all lived in separate homes at the time of their own because they're adults. And her girlfriend, who lived at my house, did not inform any of us that she didn't come home until the morning after. So, so she had called my oldest daughter and told my oldest daughter she never came home last night. My oldest daughter was like, what are you talking about? She, that, she didn't like to stay at anybody's house. She didn't even like to sleep at her sister's house. She liked to be in her own home, in her own bed. So her not coming home, huge red flag. Um, my daughter, my oldest daughter at that time, that morning my, asked my husband, what do I do? He said, go report her missing because we already know this is completely out of her character. She should be home. Um, we're calling her phone, nobody's answering. We're checking all social media, no posting, nothing. Um, so my daughter, my oldest daughter goes to report her missing and she went to the police department. The police department said, you have to wait 24 hours. She's not considered a missing person now. She's like, what do you mean? They said, no, she's, how old is she? And she said, she's 31. And she's like, no, you have to wait, you have to wait at least 24 hours, 24 hours, come back tonight. So my, she's, my daughter spoke to my husband and he said, well, I guess, because we didn't have the knowledge that you don't have to wait, uh, that he said, go, go back at around the time that she left the house and report her missing. 
my daughter did that and went to the sheriff's department at this point. And they told her, why did you wait so long to report her missing? <laughs> so now, because of that, my, my oldest daughter feels like she dropped the ball on this. Like, I should have did better. I should have pushed harder. And she goes through beating herself up almost every day since that day because she feels like she was part of the reason why she hasn't been found. Um, they pulled the girlfriend in eventually questioning her. The girlfriend lied because she didn't want her. She was worried about her own self-preservation. Well, what if they come arrest me because I smoke? You know, I smoked with her. I, 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 and I said, it doesn't matter. I, at that time, didn't even know there was weight involved. I'm just thinking she went to buy a bag of weed. Um, my daughter, my oldest daughter, did know there was weight involved. So she pulled the detective outside and told the detective, she's lying. There was, it was a bigger deal than that. It wasn't just a bag. It was weight. Eventually, through all of that, things got, I was told, because of the lie, the whole investigation kind of got pushed back because they were going in a different direction. They searched my home when I got home from Florida for any leads, but they never searched where she was. Went was according to them they couldn't because of them not having the proper information. But yet to this day, his home was never searched. Um. I'm a little all over the place, I'm sorry. Um, upon getting off the, when we were in the air on our way home, when we landed, we had found out that her car was found abandoned on the side of a road. Uh, they took it in, they did forensics. They held it for four years. That's for four years. They held her car for four years. I had to have <coughs> to get her car back. Why, I'm assuming because they feel like it was bought with drug money which it wasn't. I have everything to prove that it wasn't. I, my husband and I were the ones that actually helped her get the car with the down payment and the monthly <coughs> payments. Um, uh, um, at the, at, at this stage, um, the investigation is still ongoing. Um, <coughs> we feel that um, because the the is FBI task force has um, stepped in, um, that there's more to the case that was first thought. Um, but we have no knowledge or no information on where the uh, where the case is. And that angers me. That that angers is my is is my wife, um, because uh, uh, again, you know, you never think you never think that something is like this could occur. You you see it on milk cartons. You see it, you know, on the on the on the on the uh, K K news. It's uh, and the news says it's um, um, it's ten o'clock. Do you know where, where, where your children are? I never thought that that would bring such fear in our lives because it's true. Do you know where your children are? Do you talk to your children every day? Do you hug them? Do you kiss them? Because as you never know when you could walk out the house, they could take a walk out the house and you think life is, is grand and then a phone call occurs and your whole entire life is devastated. And you know the answers, we've, we've, she, she's been on, on TV, she, she's been on the, the news, you know, and, and we try to, to stay within the, the okay law and, and follow law enforcement and, and, and trust the system that I, tr that I 
stand to uphold, but yet I'm still a father, and my daughter is still out here, and we don't have any clues more than what we, we did the okay this first time. And the people that we thought that were her friends are not here. They don't stand by her, that they don't stand by us. You know, this is a nightmare that everybody, all of you guys walk with us, but you are family. We came to Q in the gun. Well, I'll let you go. Yeah, that we were flooding social media and um, I'm not even sure how it happened because I have like a lot of this is blur, a blur for me, but we ended up, con Q contacted us and reached out their hand to us and I was introduced to April. Um, Hi, April. <laughs> oh, we're back. And she's 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 helped me more than I could ever express. Um, you, just Q in general, like to have a place like this where people like us, it's a godsend because I didn't know where to turn. I didn't know what to do. It's like an atomic bomb just went off and when the smoke cleared everybody that i thought they would be there they were gone people didn't know what to say to me people didn't know how to talk to me people avoided me but the one good thing is god sent other people who were going to be there to help lift me up and let me know that i can do this there's days that i feel like i can't and i don't want to anymore but i have to if my daughter needs me to because she can't speak for herself anymore. I have to speak for her. And our life mission is to bring awareness to people that go missing, to bring justice for those that go missing. To, to, to gather all the resources that we can and, and bring them to, to other Fincase families that are, are going through this. When we started, not wanting to this okay journey, there was there there was nothing. Nobody knew up by us because yeah, okay, yeah. we're from that we know is upstate of. is New York. Yeah. But there's 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 nothing. There is no, you know, is communication or, or resources. You know, what I'm saying we, we were okay is fumbling through. Um, but like you said, we we came to a, a, okay a Q meeting. We we got some okay is info okay, is info, and and now our daughter's purpose her life is going to matter, no matter what the outcome is. We are going to make sure that her life is out there for other people to to see that that are are having the the okay, the the okay, the the okay, this happened. We're going to take and make sure that her name and Q and everybody else that, that we are, are working with has a voice because there are too many people out here, too, too many families out here that have missing children that don't have the okay is, is resources that, that they need to walk this godforsaken nightmare. In, okay, and, and I'll let you go. Go ahead. I mean, I, like I said, our mission is to finding her, seeking justice for her, and also bringing awareness. That's my goal in life. I never thought it would be, because you never think something like this would ever happen to you. But it's my goal now. I was ignorant to missing people until it happened to me. And that's the biggest thing. People walk around with thinking that things can never happen to them. And it happens. It happens all the time, every day. And I'm just grateful to everybody for coming, for supporting us, for having a place like this. It saved me on many days. And I just want to thank everybody for listening. I'm sorry if I was all over the place. First time I ever really actually stood up and did her story like this. But thank you. I appreciate it. So you can see how important it is to um, maintain communications with 
the agency that's investigating your case. Those of you that are here that are investigators, you see how important it is to keep the family informed. You know, obviously in the infancy of any case, everybody becomes a suspect in a missing person's case once it's reported. So it takes a little time for law enforcement to kind of piece through where they have to focus their investigation. But there comes a point in time when you realize it's okay to release information. And you, as a victim, um, parent, brother, sister, whatever the relationship is of the victim, has a right to a copy of that report. You also have a right to sit down and go through the reports with the assigned detective or investigator and see what the progress is. When all else fails, there's a federal law, FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, and you have every right to file that and get copies of whatever you want concerning that investigation. All right, our next victim's family, um, the family of Brandon McDonald. We have a representative from Brandon McDonald's family. Okay, good. Yeah. I swear I wouldn't get up here and do this, so I'm not a speaker. But, mm -hmm. but his handsome fella here is my only child. His name is Brandon McDonald. He was born June 11, 1985, and he has a daughter, Kylie Nicole McDonald, and she's 11. I'm not a speaker. I'm like the rest of these families, but I can tell you, and it's, it's amazing how you learn to become a speaker because you are the person that's got to fight for your loved one. I'm here as a mother when my heart and soul is breaking. So that's why I'm standing here. Because I've got, of course, on the behalf of his family. Have they nominated me to do this? Well, I'm not doing a very good job. But on um, March the 25th, actually, tomorrow is his two-year anniversary. This was the perfect time. Last year we did a... Um, in honor and on his birthday we always celebrate his birthday but this year we decided to do this and it's just perfect timing because then I can come and I can learn to make sure I'm utilizing all the resources and be with people that are experiencing the same thing that I am um, because like the, the previous family said um, you feel alone people abandon you because they don't know what to say. They don't. But just being there is what helps us and to be able to be here and talk and meet you guys and families and it's the all same scenario. And anyway, March the 25th, 2021, my son, Brandon McDonald, Brandon Carl Wayne McDonald. Carl is, is his father's um, <coughs> first name, which is my dad. Wayne is his daddy's middle name. On March the 25th, 2021, um, about 8 o'clock, between 8 and 8.30, his dad called me and said that Brandon had um, left probably that morning, you know, he's 35 years old, he's a young boy, you know, and his daddy didn't think nothing about it, and his daddy, he said, um, Daddy said, I'm just going to run out for a little while. He and his girlfriend had um, broke up. They'd been dating for about 10 years. And, well, probably eight or nine years. And they had broke up in December. So, you know, he, he, he's from Bladen County. Brandon and my son's from Bladen County. Clark to North Carolina, as a matter of fact. Um, he said, Dad, I'm just going to run out for a little while. He said, and I'll be back. Well, you know, his dad didn't think nothing about it. He told him he said, three times, actually, when Brandon left. He said, Daddy, I love you. I'll be back in a little while. So he didn't think nothing about it. He didn't think twice about it. 
Well, it started getting later and later. So between 8 and 8.30, um, Brandon's dad called me. Um, he was divorced, of course. He remarried, and I remarried. And um, he said, something's not right. He said, Brandon said he'd be back in a little while, and I've not heard nothing from him since. So we knew that was not like him because Brandon, we were, we were very tight. Brandon's an only child. I was an only child. Of course, his daddy was a family of 10. He had a big family. <laughs> so they all had children, and those children had children. And he said, something just ain't right. He said, I've not heard from Brandon. So I immediately called law enforcement. I said, you know, that's out of the norm. We've not heard from him or anything. So they didn't tell me, thank goodness. He, she said, he said, the detective that answered the phone, he said, was there any issues and stuff like that? And I said, well, my side of the family, which is my dad's side of the family, um, I could say this because I, that's my family, um, half of them's crazy because they all of them have men with you and I say that because I understand that. I don't say that in a negative way. I say that because I understand battle and depression, anxiety, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I said, well, he does, you know, battle that anxiety and depression. And um, he said, well, okay, let's immediately do what we need to do. And I said, okay, well, naturally, boots on the ground. Here we go. Um, Brandon's cousins, he's very close to his cousins. Those kids are so, because Brandon was 35 at the time he's missing, and he's 37 now. Um, you know, those kids are so much smarter on the computers. They know how to investigate and how to do what have you. Matter of fact, um, so we immediately started doing this and getting the information together. Well, Brandon's truck, Matter of fact, that part of it, I don't even understand how in the world that I got to that part of it because you know when you get that adrenaline flowing, you have to, your life goes because you're so focused on this one thing. So, um, Brady's daddy actually, because you know, Brady just wanted him a good girl, you know, just somebody that would love him and treat him like they're supposed to. And he just had that conversation because you know the date naps and stuff that kids get on now. And people get married by these date naps and stuff like that. He said, You need to stop because you hear so many things such as this. And you know, like the, the family said, who would have thought in a hundred years we would be in this situation? Never. We work, we keep our nose clean, we try to stay in our little bubbles, and who would have ever thought? And then you would hear these stories about these families, I'm like, my God, how in the world, bless their hearts, that hurts me so bad. How would you handle that? How would I handle that? Now I know. But, anyway, um, so we put boots on the ground, ran his truck, he had four black F-150, it was found wrecked and abandoned in Cumberland County on 926 <coughs> Burbank Street in Cumberland County, which is Fayetteville. Bass heating and air is right beside there. Witnessed the people getting out of the truck. It was a white girl and a black boy, which was not my son. We did get the truck. That was, that, that was a Thursday at 444. <coughs> um, the state trooper towed the truck took it to Legion Towing in Lumber in Fayetteville at Legion Towing. The detective that was on it went that Friday, supposedly processed the truck. We had our my son's home truck home that Friday afternoon at two o'clock. First rule. They should have never released the truck to us. First rule. So we brought the truck home. Jeff's daddy's just now took it to get it fixed because it was demolished. Where they had backed it up going down, they went to a dead end room where they backed it up so fast down the road it lost control, backed up on a chain link fence, run over the chain link fence, the chain link fence wrapped around its axles. They took the truck out. Why they took the keys, I don't know. But anyway, we got witnesses of what they looked like. That Friday, we were down there on that street talking to people, gathering information, looking, looking, looking. So the detective um, that we had at that time for the first two weeks, I mean, we were, everything, they got a file that big, that's what the family done. 
that's what our family has done. They were overwhelmed at the information that they were given them. Regardless, they should have followed up with it. Regardless. Whether it was minute or not, you don't <coughs> never know. The files that thick, that's what those young, my Brandon's cousins did. We went that Friday. My first words to the that detective, did you check any video cameras in that area? It was right there, Pure Later, across from Pure Later, that's in Bethel. No, that's a bad area. There's no cameras there. We'll come to find out. I went that Friday and I got a list that line on the nine yards as we were putting flyers out to take to them to follow up. Y'all followed up on it since I have. I'm not here to bash, but I'm here to say any family that experiences this, you're a taxpayer, you pay their salaries. I know I'm a county employee. I work with social services in the county I work in. We're taxpayers. We pay all these salaries. I thought that they would fight for us as victims. No. They fight so hard for the criminals. I didn't realize the system is broken as it was. I am really so disappointed because I thought they would be fighting for us, but they haven't. The detective told us that um, Brandon was laid up in some motel somewhere with some girl. The time that they wasted on video and um, following up with these videos and cameras and stuff to find out who these people were in my youngest vehicle, they were busy worried about that he was laid up with some girl in some motel somewhere. I said, so if he is, that's fine. At least I know my youngest okay and he's coming home to his parents, but we know better. We raised him, not we all as parents do the best we can to raise our children. I can stand here and say, my younger don't do drugs, but if he did, and this is the situation, then prove it to me, but until then, I need you to fight for my young. I need you to fight for any of these families, regardless of the circumstances. So, no, so they worked that for I don't know how many months losing that information that he was laid up, that he was a drug addict. The detective on duty said, this is just a job to me. I have worked too hard and I just need to do a demonstration. <coughs> so that's the way it went for a long time. His dad even went and met with the sheriff to get the SBI involved. And you know how that goes. The sheriff got mad and slammed the sheriff under the table and said, if you want the SBI on this, you get them. And that's when his daddy responded to him and said, I don't have that authority, but you do. Needless to say, SBI just at February the 24th finally is on our case. Why? Because we as a family have fought. We fought tooth and nail. And we will continue fighting tooth and nail because we have to fight for our families. And I'm just so disappointed in the law enforcement. But, and then finally we got a, a detective. Matter of fact, the first detective, to, it didn't have the case, but took over and calls me now and says, I'm Captain such and such. I'm not calling any names because that's not my point here. The point is, um, I'm the one that's on, the du on duty now. I've been to Iraq and I'm good at my job. Okay. Why are you on it? Well, the other uh, detective was overwhelmed and they, he couldn't do this, this and that, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, well then I expect you to do 110% if you're so good at what you do. Well, needless to say, we finally fight to the nail, try to get Monica and her team on board. Didn't want it, didn't want the SBI in it, didn't want nobody in nothing. But of course, there you go, fighting tooth and nail, fighting tooth and nail. Finally, um, a detective, a female detective got on it. Finally, we got somebody that's a bulldog. We got Monica's team on, and it's back to Monica and her team. The four, first three to four searches she did on her own, her and her team, without law enforcement support. That's why I'm so thankful for Monica and her team. Um, they fought for us when nobody else would. She didn't care. Y'all know what a bulldog she is. She fought for us. She was there. She would do what needed to be done. It didn't matter. 
and that's why we were so because like you said you live in your box you I we didn't know where to go we didn't have a clue as to what to do because my I, way I was I always thought well you know you got your back the law enforcement's got your back anything that happens they got you but you find out that's not the case now I have a totally different attitude especially the system itself is broken the system itself but then when you start off with law enforcement the, that's not their priority that makes it even worse but to but I appreciated that the detectives on it now she works hard she's got SBI on it she's got mom cousin team team on it which she's done so many searches and finally the 24th of February and I think total I was looking on and I didn't realize just how many searches we've done we've had nine searches total but of course we've not found anything and um Finally, law, um, FBI, Blake County, Scotland County, and there you go back here, see I'm everywhere, back to Scotland County, you have Scotland County, which is Laurenburg. They did the phone pings, that's where Brandon's phone ping was there. Um, pulled his phone records, there was a text between him and a girl, this is about a girl, um, text him, he met her the 1st of March, they've been texting back and forth, so he finally decides to go meet her. Well, text all the way where from track to track to track. Where you at? I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Finally pulls up in her yard and says, I'm here, where are you at? And that's the last we've heard from him. And come to find out, we have a name, we have the circle of people. But there you go again about law enforcement. It's, well, you can't prove this. And see, this is another thing, the county that Brandon come from, they wanted Scotland County to take the case because it would be easier to do it in Scotland County but still primary is Bladen because that's where he was last seen. So Scotland's a citizen. Back to the, the county, um, Bladen County goes, takes five, throws it down since here. And even says, I just want to get this off my desk. So they can't take it over. Why? Because we have all these things, but there's really no evidence. And his phone records, I thought the phone records were the Bible. I thought that's what you, that proof enough, but they would tell us that's, um, you can't prove that she had her phone. You can't prove they were texting back and forth. She gave him the address. I mean, it's to the point to where he rolled up in her yard. And we not seen him since, but that's not enough. We just need that one piece of puzzle to, um, bring this case to a closure. And I know that um, if my son was still alive, I know he would call us. But at this point, it's only been two years. Gosh, my heart goes out to these families that it's been more than two years. I tell you, it's just, it's just hard to handle and swallow for sure. But um, um, like Norma said, the endurance and the strength God gives us vessels to get through these storms. And he's given us vessels because you've got Monica and team and all these people here. And, and so, um, I don't know why. I, I said I weren't going to do this, but that makes it hard because you've got to be an advocate. You've got to be a voice for two reasons for your family. And God, because of the strength he'll give you to get through this. Because, like they said all these stories, um, you can't get through it without the strength of the Lord. You know, things happen we don't understand, but so that's what we're not supposed to understand. But this gives us, this, the Lord gives us strength to go through these storms. And without him, we can't do it. And I said, oh, Lord, I said, I keep me standing up your crown, Lord. If I'm supposed to be talking about Jesus, I need you to give me strength. But, uh, so we're still looking. We're still holding on to the hope. We're holding on to strength. My heart goes out to you, all you families. Y'all pray for me, and I'll pray for you, because unfortunately, we all have the same thing in common. But I'm going to leave you with this because this helps me as well. It helps me get through it. If I can help you, I'll help you. i pray for you. I know I ain't got 15 minutes, but let me hurry up. But my, some days the pain carries, carry, feels too heavy. 
The heartache hurts too much. The fear feels close. We all too familiar with the days. It all just feels too much. We know it can be difficult to see the promises of God through the hurt we are experiencing. We start to feel alone in what we're facing and what we feel. Through all that you are facing, God is with you. And even though your circumstances look bleak now, he is working on your behalf right this very second. He has never stopped working on your behalf and he never will. And this Bible verse is it's Limitations 3, 22, 23. reminds us the steadfast, the love the Lord never ceases. His mercy never comes to an end. They are now new. They're new every morning. I'm sorry. Great is your faithfulness. So hold on. She says you're, you're and that was good this morning, endurance and strength. God gives us this strength, y'all. And because if he wouldn't, I wouldn't be standing here talking to you because he gives me the strength to get up every morning. And, and things happen to get to. You can learn your faith and your strength. And this is what I believe. So, so thank you, Monica, and your team. Thank you for making this possible because we um, can't do it without them. And it's wonderful to know that we have them fight for us when nobody else will. And thank you for all your volunteers and your time. And I'm sorry I took a long time off. Oh, <laughs> I know we're running a little late here, and I'm going to ask a favor. Um, next up on the list is the family of Heather Elvis, but I'm going to ask Debbie if you'll hold off. Um, I'm going to bring up the family of Alyssa McLemore, if I can have them up, please. We're running a little behind here, so what I want to do is get um, uh, Alyssa's family up, let them speak, and then we'll break out to go and get some lunch and then I'm going to ask Debbie to come up and speak um, what, while we're starting with lunch, uh, if that's okay. Is Alyssa's family here? All right, we'll go back to the regular schedule. All right, Miss Elvis, if you don't mind, if you come up. Oh, okay. <coughs> Here she is. All right. I was making my donation for a sweater. This is um, Morgan Elvis. She's the sister of Heather Elvis. And of course, in the back is Debbie, um, Heather's mom. Hello, how is everybody? That's you got to do better than that. How is everybody? Great. Um, I'm Morgan Elvis. My sister is Heather Elvis. Um, she was kidnapped when she was 20 years old. And I say that specifically because it makes me feel all sorts of ways when I hear she went missing or she, it sounds like she intended to go. She didn't go anywhere. She was taken away from us, and it's important to acknowledge that. And I hear these families coming up and speaking, and I had to step out for part of them because I knew I wouldn't be able to get through my own <laughs> if I listened to you all and saw everyone crying. But I think it's important to recognize that these people were taken from us. They didn't choose to leave. And that's what makes it a reality. People sitting at home, they see these things on TV, and they say, oh, that's never going to happen to my family. My family stands 10 feet tall. These are the things that happen in the movies. In fact, my mother and I have had people come up to us and say, oh my gosh, it's like meeting a celebrity. Because most people don't realize the difference between infamy and being famous. So speaking about it and not saying she went missing, but that she was taken, she was stolen. That's what really drives it home. That verbiage is so important. And it's important to not only me, but my family as well. And I wasn't really sure what I was going to speak about coming up here. I tend to wing it anymore. I used to be a very, very specific and calculated person. Uh, my whole life, I have lived with several neurological deficits. I have Asperger's, and I have Tourette's syndrome. 
and now I have PTSD. <laughs> and as you can imagine, neurological and PTSD don't go together very well. So it made for a trying time for someone with control issues. And at this point in my life, I started winging things because I found out that if you try to control, especially in a situation where someone has taken and taken and taken in a world that continues to take and take and take your legit mind. So I got up here and I said, you know what? I'm not gonna plan for it. I'm gonna do what I think needs to be done and I'm gonna speak to these people where they're at. Because you know this story. You've heard this story 30,000 times from 30,000 different mouths, different faces, different missing. I can speak all day long and it's not gonna resonate home unless it's something different. So I'm gonna talk about something other than what everyone else has talked about. And that is what I'll be speaking on tomorrow as well, trauma-informed care. When I first realized what had happened, I was only 16 years old. And the gravity of never seeing somebody who's your other half, your best friend, you can't possibly take that in. And in that moment, I needed someone to sit down with me and tell me, this is reality. Do you know who you are right now? Do you know where you are? Do you know what has happened to you? And that seems so small to say, but the difference it makes to really grasp that reality is really what I needed at 16 years old, sitting alone or seemingly alone. And I remember, and I talk about it all the time, sitting in my living room by myself, my parents standing in the doorway, watching these uniforms that I had grown up around, all these people that were my friends and family, now strangers, walking through my home in these booties <laughs> and these blue latex gloves with their swab kits and their bags, slowly turning my home into a house, and then slowly turning that house into a very cold museum, and it has never returned to what it was. In fact, I often talk about how within those museum halls, the shells of my parents linger like ghosts stuck in the in-between trying to find the life that they once had. Because had we had trauma-informed care, had we had access to resources and education and someone to say, this is what has happened to you, we could have bypassed that lack of grasp on reality. We could have bypassed so much trauma. And I'm thankful that the Q Center came into play. Monica said something yesterday about, you know, this is the, the first point of contact. And I still remember all the stories that people say, when I first met that person from Q, and I'm gonna say it today, when I first met that person from Q, when I met Don Drexel, when I met Monica, I remember those moments because it was people who treated me as a person, not just a number on a page or Heather's sister. In reality, they didn't even say Heather's sister. It was that girl. We looked at the news stories and it was glorifying these people who kidnapped her. Tammy and Sydney this, Tammy and Sydney that. Kidnappers this with their mugshots plastered across the top of a page and Heather's name, small, at the bottom, reduced to the story of a girl who went missing. And we were reduced to just her family. But when Q came into the picture, they knew my name. They knew Heather's name, they knew my mother's name, they knew my father's name. In fact, they knew my brother's name, and most people don't even know I have a brother. <laughs> and it was not only heartwarming, but it filled my heart in a way that I knew I could continue to go because look at these people. These people who experience this every single day and continue to do it anyway. And at 16, I needed that. I didn't need someone sitting in a uniform asking questions, swabbing me inside my mouth like I was an object in my own home. I needed someone to take my hand and say, this is what's gonna happen next. And it's gonna be okay. You're not gonna be alone. Wait, me, I said I wasn't gonna cry. <laughs> a lot of times, for me, I think back on those days when I was 16, 17 years old, and I think to myself, why did you do that? And it all boils down to not having the space, not having the room, not having permission. I live with a chronic illness now called Addison's disease. It's stress-induced. It essentially means that 
my adrenal glands uh, were under stress for too long, and they said, bye, not doing this anymore. <laughs> um, and they have yet to return. And so my body doesn't want to live with this trauma anymore because nobody stepped forward and said those things in the beginning. This is what's going to happen. Let's regulate those trauma feelings that are manifesting in your body. Let's regulate those hormones. Let's get that trauma in check. Let's talk about it. And instead, I, like I said, lived in a home with a shell of two parents, with a brother across the, the different state lines who was unwilling to acknowledge what had happened because that meant it was real. So now I live with this chronic debilitating illness because nobody had the gall to say, this is something you deal with. I lived in a space where I didn't think I had room to grieve, room to feel, room to exist. I didn't want to cry in the face of my parents who were already hurting. With how much control I had lost, God forbid, I think about the control they had lost. A dad who only wants to protect his daughter who can't. I didn't want to add on to that by being yet another daughter he couldn't fix the problems for. So I held it in. I was strong. And I constantly heard, and I know some of you have heard me even yesterday speaking about toxic positivity. People who saw me get up on stage and sing the song for my sister, Come Home. It went viral and people loved it and they said, she's so strong, she's not crying. She's so strong. Look how poised she is. She's so strong. She speaks in the interviews as a voice for her sister, for her parents who can't speak. And because I heard that, and although it came from a nice place, I believed that strong meant not crying. I believed that the opposite was weakness if I showed emotion. I buried those feelings. I said, there's no room for me here. I have to be strong. And I caused more and more damage. And all I wanted in those moments was for my sister. But nobody could hear me like a prisoner in my own skin, a prisoner in my own home. And to this day, I struggle with that, with finding space to talk about how I feel. Even today, when I say I'm waning it, it's because most of the time I'm speaking from a place of education. In fact, I've padded myself with an extensive resume so that I can always speak from a place of education and knowledge. And in doing so, I avoid the parts that hurt. I avoid the one phrase I say I live by, which is transparent vulnerability. That's something that my sister taught me. To take up space, to be big, to talk when it mattered, to do what made you happy. And I used to always talk about her in interviews and say, Heather was so big, no dream was too big for her. She wanted to be a fashion designer. She had just started back school again to plan weddings because she wanted to do the wedding dress, design the wedding dress, do the hair and makeup, <clears throat> and the hair color, the haircut, and design the entire wedding. Start to stop. This is my show. I'm not afraid to take up space and do something no one else has done. And I talked about that about how inspiring it was, about how beautiful it was, about all the things that she's yet to accomplish that have been stripped away from her, and then I sat back, quiet, afraid to take up my own space, putting up a front, like everything was okay. If only I had listened early on to the words of my own sister, the words I... So now I'm here. <laughs> And this year, thankfully, I've been accepted as a state outreach coordinator for South Carolina, and I know she'd be so proud of me. <laughs> I'm very blessed to be a part of this organization. I normally stand up on the Miss American stage for in South Carolina, and I speak about trauma-informed care, and I speak about my education, and I speak about Heather and this incredible space that she took up and the incredible spaces that she could still be taking up, that I now have to walk for her. I put myself back into school again, and I will hopefully in about a year and a half walk the stage that she had planned to walk. I'll be graduating with my degree in criminal justice, focusing on behavioral 
analytics focusing on high profile crimes, missing persons. And I know that all of those times that I needed somebody and I longed for somebody who had knowledge, who had the wherewithal to tell me, what you're feeling is normal. Here is reality, take up space. That person I needed was my sister and that person I needed didn't exist in the force, unfortunately, but now I am taking up space and I'm gonna be the person that she wanted me to be. And I'm gonna fill the holes within the system that I needed filled when I was a victim walking in it. And I'm proud to be a part of this organization that showed me that I could do that, that showed me that it was okay to take up space and showed me it was okay to live, to breathe, to be here when she's not, and how to continue to keep her legacy and every other face in this legacy alive. Thank you. That's a particularly tough story for me because I worked that case and I still work that case. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna break now for lunch um, and I apologize 